there. I'm George Putnam. I'd like to begin with a fact, a simple yet shocking fact. It is this. A flood tide of filth is engulfing our country in the form of newsstand obscenity and is threatening to pervert an entire generation of our American children. We know that once a person is perverted, it is practically impossible for that person to adjust to normal attitudes in regard to sex. Yet much of this material has been described as an illustrated, detailed course in perversion, abnormal sex, crime, and violence. It is also a fact that no matter who buys this material, 75 to 90 percent of it ends up in the hands of our children. Now, you might ask yourself, why this sudden concern? Pornography and sex deviation have always been with mankind. This is true. But now, consider another fact. Never in the history of the world have the merchants of obscenity, the teachers of unnatural sex acts, had available to them the modern facilities for disseminating this filth. High-speed presses, rapid transportation, mass distribution, all have combined to put the vilest obscenity within reach of every man, woman, and child in the country. In the past few years, this obscenity traffic and salacious newsstand literature have become increasingly worse, not only in content, but in volume. This traffic continues to increase and flourish for one reason. It is big business, profitable business, for the mercenary persons who produce it, and for it more than 800 distributors. The United States Supreme Court has described it as dirt for dirt's sake. We describe it as dirt for money's sake. Obscene literature is a two billion dollar a year business. That's two billion dollars. Through this material, today's youth can be stimulated to sexual activity for which he has no legitimate outlet. He is even enticed to enter the world of homosexuals, lesbians, sadists, masochists, and other sex deviants. The psychiatric terms for these unnatural sex acts are unknown to most decent adults in our country. But through this salacious material, these abnormalities are corrupting the minds and the hearts of our children. Perversion for profit. Here is the most vicious, the most insidious feature of these publications. They constantly portray abnormal sexual behavior as being normal. They glorify unnatural sex acts. They tell youngsters that it's smart, it's thrilling, it provides kicks to be a homosexual, a sadist, and every other kind of deviant. The Military Chaplains Association of the United States, practically every major fraternal, civic, and religious organization, the juvenile court judges, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, innumerable psychiatrists, sociologists, and psychologists attribute the moral decay among our people in very large part to the obscene and pornographic literature so prevalent in our society. This moral decay weakens our resistance to the onslaught of the communist masters of deceit. A major factor that makes youngsters prime targets for this printed filth is the natural curiosity of youth about the mysterious force of sex. Yet, on virtually every newsstand is a welter of misinformation which can wreck them for life. Well, at this point, my friends, I wish to make it clear that the obscenity I'm talking about and the examples that I'm about to show you were not bought on the sly from under the counter. They were not purchased on Skid Row or on the other side of the tracks. 
They can be bought openly by anyone in drugstores, groceries, delicatessens, terminals, malt shops, cigar stores, newsstands, all over the community. They can be purchased by children, whether in a small town like McAllen and the Rio Grande, or in Chicago, New York, or Los Angeles. A prime example of one major category are the so-called girly magazines, which sell over 15 million copies a month. These highly colorful magazines picture stark nudity on slick paper. They often present their subject on bed or couch, in positions indicative of intercourse or other sex act, obviously calculated to stimulate the reader. The nakedness, the nudity of these magazines is defended and foisted upon the people by a vociferous minority in our society. They lack the moral standards and values of our Judeo-Christian heritage. They not only oppose the principles of that heritage, which has given us our rich institutions and laws, but they advocate their overthrow. For the sake of decency in this film, we have partially covered the pictures and disguised the identity of the models. But actually, these magazines not only display complete nudity, but they do so in a perverted manner. Such as this appeal to the sodomist. Such as these shots, which are typical of the preoccupation with the female breast, to a point that it has become a fetish. And this one, with its overtones of bestiality. And with lesbian implications. Another important problem common to these publications is the dwelling upon teenage participation in wild, flagrant abuses of the God-given gift of sex. This is amply depicted by the pose of this obviously young girl, her clothes in the disarray of sexual activity, with the stimulus of alcohol indicated by the tumbler placed on her thigh. And again, the breast fetish. Note the sensual expression alluded to by Dr. Sorokin, the renowned Harvard sociologist, as being the hallmark of so much of contemporary photography. And then we come to nudist magazines. If they were printed only for the nudist cult, they would never exist. Their circulation would not support the cost of printing. These total exposures are not of nudists in some instances, but rather of paid professional models. Group exposure is a hallmark of these cultists. However, it's been well stated that very few blind people join the nudist colonies. This mixture of male and female with total anatomical detail is typical of these magazines. A young boy in Philadelphia raped and killed a five-year-old girl. And while he was testifying that he had been stimulated to this heinous crime, by reading a nudist magazine, a federal court judge in Washington was granting to that very same publication a second-class mailing permit. And then we come to a terribly sad indictment of our society, the so-called physique group of publications. These magazines with a homosexual viewpoint and poses are often not understood by many youngsters who take them as instruction of body development. But psychiatrists believe that prolonged exposure of even the normal male adult to this type of publication, though he may not be aware of its true nature, will nevertheless pervert. Think then of the consequences to the inexperienced youth who in purchasing and studying this material becomes a pawn for these misfits, these homosexuals, who have a slogan that betrays the evil of the breed. Today's conquest, they say, is tomorrow's competition. See the tender age at which homosexuals prefer their conquests. Look here at the young face 
and bright smile which could be the hope of the world. But in the other half of the picture is revealed the seduction of the innocent. Look at this poor young lad, but when looking, think of the others who might follow his perfidious footsteps when photos like these are available at the corner news rack. And so it goes, countless poses, still pictures, slides, movies, all with the same content, and more of the same. This picture is not one typical of the physique magazines. It approaches another class of magazines dealing with transvestites, wherein the wearing of female garments is that which provides sex gratification for the participant. This picture, of course, merely confesses on the cover of the magazine the charges we have made. In this ad, the titles of the magazines and their table of contents speak more eloquently than I of the tremendous problem here presented. Sexual sadism, strange flagellation cults, erotic confessions of a sadist. What is fetishism? The pleasure of pain, the worship of the whip, sexual problems of a masochist, how to buy a whipping, Famous transvestites. Are cross-dressers afraid of sex? These titles lead us to an even more bizarre, but nevertheless common product of our news racks. The composite picture here speaks for itself. This type of aberration is usually depicted by showing several persons, one of whom is dominant, and binding or inflicting pain upon the other. And thus, the grotesque costuming and the significance of the extreme spiked heel and the tight boot, the riding crop, the burning cigarette, rubber and leather garments, and all the rest. And here again, an appeal to the sodomist with a play upon the buttocks, the laced leather garment. This picture hints at the common idea of bestiality. Dr. Sorokin, the renowned sociologist at Harvard, says that today the newsstands, quote, depict the world as a sort of human zoo inhabited by raped, mutilated, and murdered females and by he-males outmatching in bestiality cavemen and outlusting the lustiest of animals. Male and female alike are hardened in cynical contempt of human life and values. Unquote. The degradation of these people is so complete, as shown here, that their sex satisfaction and climax come only in being tortured themselves, of inflicting torture on others. Even the blasphemy of the human body is depicted in this devilish, sadistic shot, becoming more and more common on our newsstands of America. Seldom have you been in a supermarket without brushing by the news rack with the so-called men's adventure magazines, where with word and picture, lust and violence filled pages devoured by juvenile eyes. It would seem that publishers of this material deliberately print these magazines, in the parlance of the narcotic, to hook the adolescent into the knowledge of the unnatural. These publishers know well that once so exposed, the insatiable curiosity of youth will cause him to delve deeper and deeper into this grotesque material until his utter depravity is complete. All of you have heard of mail order obscenity. The problem is graphically illustrated by these advertisements, all of which were clipped from this one copy of a single girly magazine. In these, as well as in all the other groups of magazines, the rawest materials can be ordered through the United States mails. And thus, newsstand publications create a market for illustrated, hardcore pornography. After these displays, you probably think that there couldn't be anything worse. But perhaps the most insidious single group of publications is the cheap pocketbook. In page after page of these so-called novels, sex organs, positions of intercourse, 
abnormal sex practices of every kind are described with intimate physical detail. Nothing is left to the imagination. An invitation even is extended to the reader to come join the fun. Teenagers particularly are liable to fold down the corners of the obscene passages, the more readily to dwell on them over and over and over again. And the teenager soon gets to recognize the publishers of the worst material and seeks out their products. This is a book typical of many. It is called Sex Jungle. I would like to read you a passage from this book, not because it is particularly obscene, but because it portrays a philosophy that is aimed at our young people. This philosophy is not just in this book, but through all of this material. A 16-year-old boy, member of a gang, has just clubbed an old man in the course of a robbery. And he's thinking back over his accomplishment. Maybe he would die. That would mean I had murdered him. I smiled, trying the idea on for size. One of the things that always had cheesed me a little was that I had no kills to my credit. I'd been in plenty of rumbles, but somehow I'd never cooled anyone. Well, maybe now I'd have my first one. I couldn't feel very proud of sculling an old man, but at least I could say that I'd scored. That was a big kick. What are we alive for except to grab all the kicks we can? Sex? That's a kick. Sure, damn good one. A guy can't ever get enough of that. Drinking. That's another kick. An okay kick. Marijuana? Sure. M's good, too. If you don't let it get the upper hand with you. Heroin. H. There was something to be said for that. I'd tried it. But horse isn't such a good kick because it takes more than it gives. And before long, you use it, and you don't get any kick. There were others. Rape. That was a kick that I'd tried a couple times. It makes you feel real big to grab a girl, rip her clothes off, and take her. The way I figure it, you get kicks from what you do to other people. If you take something from a girl that she values, you've gained something. Or at least that's the way I look at it. I'm brainier than a lot of gang guys. I spent a lot of time thinking. Maybe I should have been a professor. And the way I thought it out, taking a girl's cherries, a hell of a gratifying thing. And so was murder. That was one kick I hadn't experienced yet. Taking life, that's living big. Only I wasn't happy about doing it this long, drawn out way. An old man slowly dying. There wasn't much kick in that. But sticking a knife into a guy, twisting upward, uh, that must be something. End of quote. I repeat, my friends, I have not shown you these pictures and quoted from this material merely to shock you or make this presentation sensational. It is only to show what is openly available on your newsstands. And think of this. What you have just seen is not the worst material available. And yet, even this required editing to make it suitable to be shown in this film. The vast majority of this material is too obscene to show or to quote to you. Well, certainly other factors are contributing to the moral decay that concerns so many decent people today. But isn't it reasonable to presume that material such as you've just seen is one of the major factors? And it is important to realize that even if you knew that your own children would never, under any conditions, buy or read this material, if you knew this, and you can't know this, 
You must realize that they are constantly exposed to those who do read this material and who might be triggered into compulsive acts of sex violence. As I said before, the most insidious feature of these publications is that they glorify crime and ridicule law and authority. Vice is presented as fun. This warped idea of fun has contributed to the fact that one out of every 20 children born in the United States last year was illegitimate. The rate of illegitimacy has been steadily climbing. And the care of these children costs taxpayers $1 billion a year in government aid. This does not take into account the human misery or suffering that cannot be measured in dollars and cents. What these publications promote as fun has helped to increase the spread of venereal disease in this country. Reported syphilis has increased more than 300% in the last five years. The incidence of gonorrhea has been steadily rising. One segment of the increase occurs among the expanding homosexual population. But even more startling is the fact that the greatest increase in venereal disease is among children 10 to 18 years of age. The increasing crime rate also parallels the increase in obscenity. A vicious crime of violence, murder, forcible rape, or assault to kill is being committed every three minutes. The total cost of crime in human waste, misery, tax, and material loss is beyond calculation. Sex mad magazines are helping to create criminals faster than we can build jails to house them. This two billion dollar a year racket is challenging every mother and father in this country and everyone interested in the welfare of our children. The question is this, do you want your children stimulated and driven into an early, unstable marriage before they have had a chance to achieve the economic, educational, and emotional stability necessary for family life? Do you want your son enticed into the world of homosexuals or your daughter lured into lesbianism? Do you want either of them to discover how to get sexual gratification by inflicting pain on themselves or by torturing other people? Do you want them to lose all chance of a normal, happy, married life? Opponents to the control of obscene literature state that the circulation of this material is the price we pay for freedom in this country. But the United States Supreme Court does not agree. Smut peddlers do not have the right to contaminate our society. This is a nation of laws, and you and I have a constitutional guarantee to police protection of our welfare. The law is our weapon. Here in a typical courtroom, a judge is instructing the jury in the case of a smut peddler. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Lakewood has a valid constitutional legal ordinance prohibiting the publication, sale, or distribution of obscene material. It is under this law that the defendant herein was arrested and prosecuted. The Supreme Court of the United States has clearly stated that obscenity is without constitutional protection. The Supreme Court has defined obscenity as material which deals with sex in a manner appealing to the prurient interest. That is, material having a tendency to excite lustful thoughts. It might be well to point out that it is not necessary to prove that this material has led to an act of violence or sex crime, but merely that the material taken in itself is obscene. The test is whether to the average person applying contemporary community standards, the dominant theme of the material taken as a whole appeals to the prurient interest. If material meets this test, it is without the constitutional guarantees of freedom of press and speech. Now you, the jury, must apply the test of obscenity to the material distributed by this defendant. 
You, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, are the sole triers of the facts in this case. The application of this legal test to the evidence is to be made by you and you alone. You, in effect, by your decency, determine the level of morality in this community. You, indeed, are the peers of the community. And so, my friends, the question is whether you consider publications, samples of which you have seen in this film, to be below your community standards. To find the answer, ask yourself these questions. Would you display this material on your living room table? Do you find such material in the living rooms of your friends and neighbors? Would you read stories from these publications to your family or friends? Would you undertake to sell this material from door to door? Of course you would not. Your community standards are far above this depraved material. Now. What can you do to solve the problem? You've seen the nature of the problem. You've heard the legal solution. But what can you as an individual in your own community do? First, start with your own home. Check your own reading and the reading matter coming into your home for your entire family. Remember, children can be contaminated by magazines brought into the home by adults. Second, Promote good reading. Encourage children to use the library. Good books and magazines will help build positive values that are a protection against obscenity. Third, check neighborhood outlets that display pocketbooks and magazines, grocery stores, newsstands, malt shops, everywhere from the corner drugstore to the barber shop. And if you find obscenity for sale, call it to the attention of the owner. Remember, trading in stores that sell salacious material supports the obscenity racketeers. Fourth, report objectionable material to the police. Every arrest and prosecution, every conviction is a step in the education of the public to the solution of the problem. Remember, the law is your weapon. Fifth, write letters of commendation to police prosecutors, other public officials, and to the newspapers whenever they take action against obscenity. Such letters and other direct contacts inform the public officials how high your community standards are. Six, form a committee for decent literature within your fraternal, civic, or religious organization. This committee will keep your own organization informed and active against this plague of filth. Form a Citizens for Decent Literature group in your community. Such a community organization will awaken people to the problem. It will provide speakers and other means to educate the public and arouse public opinion which will support the police and prosecutors so that prompt, vigorous enforcement of the law can be expected. Information and advice on the organization of a Citizens for Decent Literature unit can be obtained by writing to CDL, Box 12, Cincinnati, Ohio. So you can see from what I have told you and shown you today that a moral decay is spreading through our country and our society. This same type of rot and decay caused 16 of the 19 major civilizations to vanish from the earth. Magnificent Egypt, classical Greece, imperial Rome, all crumbled away, not because of the strength of the aggressor, but because of moral decay from within. But we are in a unique position to cure our own ills. Our Constitution was written by men who put their trust in God and founded a government based on His laws. These laws are on our side. We have a constitutional guarantee of protection against obscenity. And in this day especially, 
we must seek to deliver ourselves from this twisting, torturing evil. We must save our nation from decay and deliver our children from the horrors of perversion. We must make our land, the land of the free, a safe home. Oh God, deliver us, Americans, from evil.